Welcome to another ultralight airplane design video from the ultralight airplane workshop. In this video, we're going to get back to aerodynamic design of the UWS-4 ultralight airplane. And in this case, when I say ultralight, I mean an airplane that meets the requirements of federal aviation regulations, and this is federal aviation in the United States, part 103. And real quickly, that means the empty weight of the airplane has to be less than 254 pounds, it has to stall at a speed greater than or equal to 24 knots. The level flight full power cruise speed cannot be more than 55 knots. And you can only have a single seat. So those are the major restrictions on a Part 103 airplane. So this is going to be, I think, a two-part series. There's going to be Part A and a Part B. And we're going to talk about stability. In this case, pitch stability of the Uribus 4 Ultralight Airplane. And that's why I chose the picture that I did here. We're going to be looking at the pitch stability, which is controlled by this horizontal surface back here at the tail end of the airplane, the horizontal stabilizer and elevator. And in fact, these little parts that stick down here, so the vertical stabilizer and rudders are actually going to play a part in this. And before we get too far in this, I want to give a great big thanks to the patrons that support this channel on Patreon. You guys are what keeps this going. Thank you. Let's continue with the tradition that we have on this video series, the aerodynamic series. We're going to briefly talk about what we learned in the last series, just a quick summary. And as a reminder, to help us in the aerodynamic design, we're using a book by Dan Raymer called Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders. I've really enjoyed this book. It really does simplify the aerodynamic design. So in the last series, we we're using a chapter from Dan's book, or actually a section, called Weight Estimation. So that was part 12, subparts A through D. We did weight estimation on A, B, and C. And then in part D, we figured out center of gravity, the CG. Now I figured out two different centers of gravity. One with a 110 pound pilot, and that will cover the top 90% of all female weight pilots. And then a 257 pound pilot. And that's the bottom 90% of all male pilots. And that also include 30 pounds of fuel. So that's the gross takeoff weight then, if we can include the empty weight of the airplane, full load of fuel, and these two pilot weights. I also did a 170 pound pilot too. So for the 110 pound pilot, the CG was back at 31% of the mean aerodynamic core of the wing. And for the 257 pound pilot, the center of gravity was at the 20.4% mean aerodynamic cord of the wing. Now the mean aerodynamic cord of our wing is just the cord of the wing, the distance from the leading edge to the trailing edge because we're using a rectangular wing. And as always, I want to put this little disclaimer in here. What we're doing in this video is not a substitute for Dan's book. You can't take what we're doing in these videos and directly use it. If you want to learn about aerodynamic design, at least at a very high level, Dan's book is the way to do it. You need to go look at it, read it, understand it. And by the way, if you want to get Dan's book and you wouldn't mind helping out the channel a little bit, there's a link down in the description of this video to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop book page. There's a few different books on that page, not just the one from Dan. Another one you might want to think about is Chris Hines' book, Fly Your Own Wings, and another book there on Stress Without Tears. I've got all three of those books. I really enjoy them. I think they're very useful. But if you click on a link on that page to buy a book, it'll take you to Amazon. That's an Amazon Associates link. And if you use that link to buy the book, the Ultralight Airplane Workshop will get a small commission on that sale. Now, let's get to the meat of this video. So what we're going to work on in this video and the next video is we're going to work on neutral point and static margin. So let's talk about what stability is, because that's what we're really going for here. And that's a tendency of the airplane to return to straight flight. I'm not going to say level, because it does not necessarily have to be level, but at least straight flight after there's been an aerodynamic disturbance to the airplane. So it could be a gust of wind. It could be the pilot maneuvering the airplane. It could be the pilot just knocking a rudder pedal or the stick a little bit. Something that caused the airplane to depart from straight flight Stability will make it return back to straight flight. But we're, in this video, really going to be talking about pitch stability. Now, pitch is up and down. So pitch stability then implies that if you cause the nose to go up or down, pointed away from where straight flight was, then the airplane 
using aerodynamic forces will return back to the original straight flight. Now one of the things that we need to know in order to figure out if we have this pitch stability is we need to know the neutral point of the airplane. And one way to think of the neutral point as that aerodynamic center. Now this aerodynamic center is a point on the airplane somewhere between the front of the airplane and the back of the airplane where the pitching moment will be independent of the angle of attack. So a pitching moment is a force that tries to rotate the nose up or rotate the nose down. Of course, the angle of attack is the angle of the airplane relative to the wind. So you could have the wind coming in horizontal, but the airplane might be pointed up. So what we're saying is that the pitching moment at this angle would be the same as the pitching moment at this angle. So somewhere on the airplane is going to be a point where that pitching moment is the same regardless of angle attack. So let's figure out how to calculate the neutral point. Now this is an equation I got out of Dan's book, and I know there's a lot here, but it's not too bad, especially if you use a spreadsheet to help you out. The result, this x sub np, is going to be some distance from the zero point on your x-axis of the airplane. The x-axis of your airplane, by convention, is the longitudinal axis. That is the axis that runs from the nose of the airplane to the tail of the airplane. And it's going to be zero, usually somewhere up close to the front. It could be the nose cone, it could be a firewall, it could be the very front of the fuselage. Now, for the UVS-4, since it's a pusher configuration, I'm using the very front of the fuselage for the zero point. And then the numbers on that axis, the x-axis, increase going back toward the tail. So what we're going to have here is the distance of the neutral point from that zero location. Now we're also using x in a couple other places. We're using x for the wing and x for the tail. So x for the wing is the location of the one quarter chord, mean aerodynamic chord of the wing. And then x tail is the one quarter mean aerodynamic chord of the tail location. So that's where we're going to plug in here and here and underneath here. So the next thing to figure out is this C sub L alpha of the wing. That is the lift curve of the wing, not the lift curve of the airfoil. And then also down here, we'll need the lift curve of the tail too. Now you're going to subtract out a term from the fuselage. The portion of the fuselage that is in front of the quarter, quarter of the wing is destabilizing. So you see there's a negative here. So that actually moves the neutral point forward. So essentially what we're doing is the quarter cord of the wing is kind of the most forward that you would have the neutral point. The fuselage is destabilizing, so it actually moves it a little bit forward, but the tail is stabilizing, so it moves it quite a bit backward. So you're adding that in. Now lift coefficient of the wing can be found by this equation here, where you're basically taking the sweep of the wing, and that's at the quarter cord, sweep the wing here, and the aspect ratio of the wing. Now this equation assumes that the lift slope of the airfoil is about 0.11. So this is the fuselage term. I've, there's no need to really go over the equation, except I'll go th over a couple parts of it. This W fuse is the maximum width of the fuselage. And then you have the length of the fuselage, and then you have a ratio of the portion of the fuselage that's in front of the quarter cord divided by the length of fuselage. So it's basically giving you a percent of how much the fuselage in front of the quarter cord of the wing. And then we have this tail term, and it's got a lot of modifiers. It's got some modifiers that take into account where the horizontal tail is in relation to the downwash of the wing. So the higher that horizontal tail is, the more effective it is, the less it's impacted by the downwash of the wing. The lower it is, the worse it is. It's going to help move that neutral point forward because it's more impacted by the wing. So for example, this coefficient of 0.85, that assumes a low placed horizontal tail like on most airplanes. But if you have a T-tail, that means your horizontal tail is going to be higher, and so it's going to be more effective, and so there's going to be a 0.95 here. And then there's another factor that also takes into account the placement of the tail, and that's this little coefficient here and it's 0.6 normally, 0.7 for a T-tail, and it's actually, there's a little more that you can do with this, and we'll talk about it when we do the spreadsheet. So really, even though there are a whole lot of terms here, a lot of description, it's really pretty easy. You just plug some numbers in, and it comes out with the result. So here's the spreadsheet that I came up with. 
Let me zoom in a little bit here to make it easier to see. So I've entered all the numbers that we just talked about on the last slide. So I have the chord of the wing, the mean air limit chord here. So I'm at 5.186 feet. I want to know what the leading edge of the wing is, just to help with some other calculations also. So that's at 4.618 feet from my zero point. And the zero point is up close to the very tip top tip of the front of the fuselage. So the one quarter mean aerodynamic core of the wing is at 5.91 feet. Now I don't have any sweep on my wing, rectangular wing, so that's zero. Aspect ratio of my wing is 4.43, almost 4.5. Surface area of my wing is a little over 120 square feet. Now the lift slope of the wing. So we went through the calculation of the lift slope, which has the cosine of the sweep and aspect ratio and that 10 and 18 underneath. So that calculation, using most of this information here, comes out with 0 0.07. Now, if you remember right, I said a typical airfoil, not the wing, but the airfoil has 0.11. So you can see that the lift slope of a wing is less than the airfoil. Now, the higher your aspect ratio, the higher that number would be. And of course, as we know, sweep has an impact on it, but for ultralight airplanes, almost none of us have a sweeping wing. So once we multiply that lift slope times the X of the wing, we come out with a value of 0.4205. Okay, so let's go back to that real quick. So this value here, these two multiplied together, 0.4205. Now I did the tail portion of that equation next. I skipped the fuselage, fuselage a little bit farther down. So we got the mean aerodynamic cord or the horizontal tail of 3.44 feet. The leading edge of the tail is at 18 feet from my zero point. So that makes the quarter mean aerodynamic cord of the H tail at almost 19 feet. Now the aspect ratio of my tail currently is 1.75, okay. Now we include the surface area in a different part of the equation, but I want to put it here with the tail numbers and same thing for the surface area of the elevator, but it's not used in the equation we're going to work on right now. So the lift slope of the tail is 0 0.049. So we had 0 0.7 for the wing. And because the aspect ratio is so much different and so much lower on the horizontal tail, that means the lift slope of our horizontal tail is even lower than the wing. So basically 0 0.05 versus 0 0.07. Okay, so now the K term. So this coefficient, this 0.85, I'd change to 0.95 because I have a T tail essentially. Let's go back and look at that. So here is the tail of the Univis 4. So I essentially have the same thing as a T tail, but not quite and actually has an impact here before too long. But the horizontal tail is sitting on top of the rudders. So I'm going to use the 0.95 since my horizontal tail is so far up. It's a T-tail and it's quite a bit above the wing. So that's why we have that coefficient. Instead of 0.85, I'm using 0.95. The downwash number, again, that could have been 0.6 if we had a tail down low, but our tail is way up high. We're up out of the downwash. Well, not completely out of it, but quite a bit up out of the downwash. So I'm using 0.7 instead of 0.6 here. Now I could have used a 0.8 if I had a high aspect ratio wing because that reduces the downwash even more on the horizontal tail if it's up high. And again, you might want to read Dan's book. He talks about that a little bit more. So that K of the tail term has now been calculated. And so now we can calculate that K tail times the X tail and we get the 0.8. Now here's the fuselage portion, the maximum width. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit. Well, not really cheat. I'm going just to put a, a maximum of three feet on here because eventually I'd like to have a full fuselage. But at the moment, I'm not talking about doing that. I'm talking about having open fuselage. So that would be about 24 inches. But I also have the booms on this airplane. And those are about six inches wide each. So I'm going to add that in. So that ends up being three feet wide if I include all that together at the widest spot. Length of the fuselage is roughly 18 feet. So that length ratio we talked about, the portion of the fuselage that's in front of the quarter cord relative to the whole fuselage. So here's the portion that's in front of the quarter cord. And then that ratio is 0.32. So basically a third of the fuselage is in front of the quarter cord. So now we come up with the K fuse that we need for equation. And now we have all the information that we need to do our calculation. This K fuse, this K tail times the X tail, 
and the slope times the position of the wing. So now we add this one, we add this one, and we subtract this one. This one actually should be bolded. So we do that and we get this value right here. So the neutral point of the wing, so our equation here is this value here. So that means the neutral point of our airplane is at six, roughly six and a half feet from our zero point. Now you can do a quick sanity check here. Is this number behind the quarter cord of your wing? It should be. So let's look up here. Quarter cord of the wing is six roughly, 5.9, and we've got six and a half. So yes, that's behind the quarter cord of the wing. So at least that's working correctly. Now, how much of a percentage of our wing cord is that? Because we'll frequently talk about center of gravity as a percentage of the wing cord. Well, that's at 35.5% of the wing cord. So it's not terribly far back, but it is back there a little ways. So what we need to do is keep our center of gravity in front of this 35.56. If our center of gravity is right at this 35.56, that means we're neutrally stable. We're not unstable, we're not stable, we're right in between. Now, if our center of gravity is behind this point, we're unstable. So any disturbance of the airplane from level flight, actually probably even without it being disturbed, it's gonna divert and go off some direction. In this case, we're talking about pitch stability, so it would go divert either pitching up or pitching down and it would keep on going. So when we're unstable, it's highly skilled pilot might be able to keep the airplane from crashing, but he's going to be tired. He's gonna be working continuously. You can never take your hand off the stick. You're always going to be correcting the airplane trying to diverge from stable flight. Now, even if you're at the neutral point with your center of gravity, it's still going to be a lot of work. So you've got to be in front of it. And the farther in front of it you are, the more stable you are. Let's work that a pilot has to do. So where is our center of gravity? Now, our furthest aft center of gravity was with a light pilot. So let's go take a look at that. So our furthest aft CG with a 110-pound pilot is at 31%. 31 versus... 35 and a half. So we are four and a half percent in front of the neutral point. And that's this number down here. That's uh, not very far in front of the neutral point. But <laughs> we have an interesting situation here that with a conventional tail you wouldn't have. Let's go back and look at the view of the tail again. So I mentioned before that we were going to come back to this high tail with the rudders, the vertical stabilizers out here on the ends here. Well, these vertical stabilizers, because they're out the ends of our horizontal tail, act like end plates. These end plates basically prevent, or not prevent, but reduce the amount of high pressure from one side of the horizontal tail going to the other side of the horizontal tail. What this is like is basically increasing the aspect ratio of the horizontal tail. It's not physically increasing it, it's effectively increasing it, because we're going to have less losses due to induced drag. And induced drag is what I was just talking about, air going from the high pressure side to the low pressure side of the horizontal tail. So we have a more effective aspect ratio. It's as though the horizontal tail is longer. Well, if our effective aspect ratio is actually longer than what we put in for the physical aspect ratio, what does that do for our neutral point? Well, I happen to remember that Horner in his book on Fluid dynamic lift talks about how the end plate effect changes the effective aspect ratio of a flying surface. So I went and did the calculation. So what Horner says is you take the height of the vertical tail divided by the span of the horizontal tail. So that's a ratio of this distance by this distance. And that's gonna be this right here. So our height is 1.4 on the vertical tail the span of the horizontal tail is six feet. So that gives us this ratio here. You multiply that by 1.9, and then we add one, and then we multiply by our current aspect ratio. So that is 1.7. So you go and calculate that out, and we get an effective aspect ratio of 2.53. So our aspect ratio has gone up quite a bit. So what is the end effect of doing that, having a higher aspect ratio on your tail? That changes our neutral point from 6.46 to 6.59. And that's in the X position. 
So as a percentage of our wing cord, that goes from 35 and a half roughly to 38. So it increased, what, about roughly two and a half percent. So it moved it back quite a bit just because we have a better effective aspect ratio on the tail. So how good are these numbers? We said we have to have our center of gravity in front of that. And here we went from 4.5% uh, in front to 7.1% in front. Is that good enough? Is that stable enough? The farther in front it is, the more stable it is. So that distance of the center of gravity in front of the neutral point is our static margin. So x the neutral point minus the x of our center of gravity divided by our wing cord gives our static margin. And then you'd multiply that by 100 to get a percent. So a static margin from 12 to 20% is very stable. Well, we're, we're not at 12%. We're under that still. And then he says from 9% to 12% is sporty, which means it's more maneuverable, essentially. And then he goes on to say that for a pusher prop, you can actually reduce these numbers up here by 3 to 5%. So let's do that. That means we're 9 or 7% up to 17 to 15% for very stable. And then for sporty, you're six or 4% or nine or 7%. And what were we? We were at seven, a little over 7%, right? We are at 7.11. So that means for our lightest pilot, 110 pound pilot, because that moves our CG so far aft, we're just barely into the sporty area. Now that means for our lightest pilot, our 110 pound pilot, they're going to be in the sporty category. Now with the heavier pilot, that's going to start moving you out of the sporty category up to the very stable area. And that's because as the pilot gets heavier, that ends up moving our CG forward. So the heavier the pilot, the more forward that CG goes, the more stable the airplane is going to be. So with our heaviest pilot, our 257 pound pilot, it's going to be very, very stable. Now, if we were a little bit worried about stability for a light pilot, especially if they are a new pilot, doesn't have much experience, what we could do is come down here and talk about this. We can add ballast to the nose of the airplane. That would move the CG a little bit more up into the more stable area. Now, I mentioned how having that 257 pound pilot is going to move the CG much farther forward. In fact, if you remember, we said it was up around 20 inches. Let's go back and look at that. So the CG with the 257 pound pilot, the CG is at 20.4% of the cord. That's quite a bit in front of even the quarter cord, 25%. Our static margin there is around 17%. So we're getting right up there to the high portion of very stable. But there's something else we need to consider. We gotta keep that horizontal tail from stalling when we have a far forward CG. That When that CG is way forward, that tail has to push down really hard. And we gotta keep that tail from stalling because if it stalls at that far forward CG, we can't keep the nose up. We just can't fly the airplane. So in the next part, in part B, we're gonna figure out we're going to figure out if that tail is big enough, if it can provide enough force without stalling to support that really heavy pilot with that far forward center of gravity. Well, that's it for this video, guys. Thanks for watching. Until next time.